Hey, Superintendent of Jefferson County Public Schools, Jane Hammond. Principal of Columbine High School, Frank DeAngelis. And, stu and the student body president of Columbine High School, Heather Dinkle. Jane Hammond, Superintendent of the Jefferson County Public Schools. Welcome. What great energy, I love it. President and Mrs. Clinton, welcome to our Jefferson County community. Our community has been wounded and we are healing. We want to thank you very much for being with us. There are two other people on the platform that don't need an introduction, but I will give them one anyway. I want to introduce the principal of Columbine High School. introduce the president of the student body of Columbine, Heather Dinkle. members and leaders that have joined us here today, I'd like to mention the groups and if you could hold your applause till I finish the list, I would really appreciate it. Just for a few minutes, we have the representatives from our U.S. congressional delegation. We have the governor and representatives from the governor's cabinet. We have state officials. We have our state legislators. We have our county commissioners. We have our school board, our school district cabinet. We have representatives, parents, students, and staff from Dakota Ridge and from Chatfield. We have superintendents from our neighboring school districts. 
We have representatives from business, PTA, and accountability. We have men and women that serve at the district, local, state, and federal level in fire, health, safety, and law. Let's recognize them. All of us are here to demonstrate our support, commitment, and dedication to the students, staff, and community of Columbine High School. We have been a symbol of the worst nightmare that you could imagine, with the loss and injury of our students and staff member. We will also be a symbol for the nation of strength, of dedication, of commitment, and resilience as we pull together as a community. With Columbine at our core, we know that we can not only survive, but thrive. And we must do that. I want to tell you why I know that we can do that. On February 23, 1999, the students that I talked to described Columbine High School. They said, we have dedicated and excellent staff and we have staff members who accept us and know us as people and individuals. The parents said, we have quality staff and we have an excellent academic program. That has always been true of Columbine and it always will be true of Columbine. Families who have lost their children, their father, their husband, they carry the heaviest burden. Let's not let the bright light of the stars that we lost on April 20th go out. It is our responsibility to make sure that they did not die in vain. The event of April 20th is over. But what is just beginning is the rebuilding of our community. This experience today together with the President and First Lady with us is a symbol of this as a national situation, the tragedy and the learning from the tragedy and the rebuilding that we must do. In our community, our busy parents have been reprioritizing to give their children greater support. The schools and other community members are focusing on safety on creating cultures in our community that accept all children, and that we continue our work to increase student learning. We must keep on with that work. It is critical. We come together, we rebuild together, and we heal together. I am proud to be the superintendent of the Jefferson County Public Schools. It is a school district and a community with great strength. We have the greatest challenge that we have ever had. We also have the greatest opportunity. It is with great pride 
that I would like to introduce an extraordinary leader, Principal Frank DeAngelis. I am blessed to be the principal of one of the finest high schools in America. You are a major part of my life, and I am so fortunate to be a member of the Columbine family. One could not find a more caring, dedicated, and professional staff. You have never shined more radiantly. Your heroic acts save so many lives, and I know that you will be there to mend the shattered lives of our students and ease their pains. If I could have the staff of Columbine High School please stand up and be recognized. I have never been more proud of my Columbine children. The class of 99's leadership has been outstanding. And all of the Columbine students are to be commended for the manner in which they handled themselves during these tragic times. Our nation feels the pain that you have experienced the past month and I know that they are proud of each and every one of you. Thank you, my children. <laughs> to my Columbine family, I give my love and continued support. As principal, I will not allow this tragic act to erase 27 years of excellence that Columbine High School has represented. And I feel strongly that our school can survive this tragedy because of our strong foundation. And this will pave the way on our road to recovery. Ernest Hemingway stated, the world breaks everyone, and then we are stronger in broken places. The memories of those who died will make us stronger in broken places and forge an even stronger bond with those who survived. The members of CHS will serve as models for the rest of the world, and I hope that the love, compassion, unity, and tolerance shown by our family will continue and provide the inspiration and motivation for our world to become stronger. I look forward to the day that we once again walk proudly down the halls of Columbine High School holding our heads high. We want our school back, and I hope that you will join me at CHS when we begin the 1999-2000 school year. We survived. We will prevail. We have hope to carry on because we were Columbine. We still are Columbine and we will be an even stronger Columbine from this day forward. <laughs> On behalf of Columbine High School, I would like to express our deepest appreciation 
for the support and encouragement that has been given to us by our nation's leader. President Clinton and the First Lady have stepped forward to provide the leadership during this time of crisis, a time in which our country was in desperate need. You have provided the strength for us to become a more caring, loving, and strong nation, and we thank you. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Governor of Colorado, Bill Owens, for your leadership and support. In addition, Columbine High School is eternally grateful to all the citizens of Colorado and the people across the nation and around the world for your outpour of love and generosity during our time of need. Your acts of benevolence will never be forgotten and will allow us to mend our broken lives. A special thank you to Mr. John DeStefano and the members of the Jefferson County School Board and Dr. Jane Hammond and the members of the Jefferson County School District for coming together as one during these devastating times and providing the much needed support for the Columbine community. To all staffs, students, and parents throughout Jefferson County, your acts of kindness will be with us forever. Once again, the Columbine family would like to thank all of you from the bottom of our hearts. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a young lady who has provided leadership for the members of our student body. She has been a pillar of strength during these difficult times, and as a result of her actions, CHS will move strongly forward. Join me in welcoming our student body president, Ms. Heather Dinkle. here at your smiling faces and knowing that I get to represent you is such an honor. So thank you guys to begin with. Um, at this time we get to represent the First Lady and introduce her to you. Um, we've received many cards and letters from across the nation and even other countries and I think it's important for us to welcome her here today because she is a symbol of the nation's caring for us. And so if you'd like to introduce the First Lady. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Dr. Hammond. Thank you, Mr. DeAngelis. And most of all, thank you, the students of Columbine. You know, when we walked in, I saw the cheer that was going from one side to the other side, and the chant, we are Columbine, that went back and forth and the enthusiasm and the energy that was behind that cheer. But to me, it was more than that. It was a real statement about who you are and indeed who we all are. Because in a very real way, what happened here at Columbine has so deeply affected the rest of our country that we are all Columbine. We have suffered and wept and prayed and hoped and, yes, cheered as lives have been mourned, as those who are injured have healed, as parents and citizens have come together to ask, where do we go from here? 
And as all of you who are the students of Columbine have shown us over this last month your courage and your grace, your kindness and your love, we have just spent time with the families of those who lost someone they loved. It's not the first time that my husband and I have done that. We've listened to and looked into the eyes and held the hands and felt the hugs of men and women and children who have suffered the evil and the tragedy that intervened unexpectedly, a bombing of an embassy, a shooting down of a plane or an accident that lost lives. And we've always been moved by and felt deeply the pain that others were suffering. And no tragedy is ever like any other tragedy because every person is unique and everyone who is lost was a gift of God that should have been cherished and who has to be remembered. But what happened here at Columbine a month ago has had an impact unlike any that I have ever seen or felt. It has pierced the heart of America. And what we are all looking for and what I all always hope we can find from a tragedy like this is how we move forward together to do what we can to help prevent this ever happening again. Now, of course, even today, yet another school was terrorized by a shooting. Thankfully, no one was killed, but it should never have happened. So as we meet here, as we imagine, as hard as it must be, what this past month has been for you, the losses, the questions, the glare of the world's spotlight, I think we all know that there are no words that are adequate to your experience. But I hope you know that the way you've conducted yourselves and your stories and the stories of those killed and injured have been an inspiration and a motivation for many people whom you'll never meet. We're inspired by the strength of the students and the teachers, by your determination to return to school, to finish out your year with your friends and your classmates. We're inspired by your refusal to let violence and hatred win. We're inspired by the courage of the families who have faced a moment that every parent prays will never happen. We're inspired by the words we heard today as well as what we've heard in the past month as to how so many of you are looking for opportunities to reach out to make sure that here in this community and as far as the ripples can go, the messages that you feel you want to communicate to each other will be heard. We heard those messages today, listening to parents, brothers and sisters, grandparents, a wife, children. And the message had many different sounds to it coming from different voices. But what struck me was how clearly those who have been most wounded want to turn this into something positive for others. That is what we have seen from the Columbine community. And it has inspired reactions literally around the world. One family told us of receiving a letter 
from France, written completely in French. They couldn't read it, but they knew what it said. I know of the young boys and girls around the country who've been writing letters and drawing pictures to share their feelings. And I know here in Jefferson County the services that have been offered and the way people are trying to knit together more help. Many of you will be graduating, and I congratulate you. It wasn't so long ago that our daughter graduated, and I remember the conversations uh, around our kitchen table and listening to her friends as they were planning their summer plans or thinking about college or going to work. And I know you're thinking about all of that as well. But perhaps more than others, you may also be thinking about what kind of community and country you want to raise your own children in someday and how we will take what happened in Columbine and not only never forget it, but use it to make more opportunities for others to live the kind of lives we would have wished for those who were lost. Imagine what our country could accomplish if everyone acted as your principal described you as a family, a members of the human family as well as the Columbine family, the American family, members of a community and a nation that was really committed to making sure that we helped each other, we cared about each other, we reached out to one another. Imagine, as we heard from your principal, what it would mean if more parents in this community and around our country thought about what more they could do to spend time with their own children, to listen to your concerns, your dreams, your fears, your aspirations. And imagine what could happen if more young people talked more openly with one another as well as with their parents and other adults, looking for ways to heal the wounds that all of us carry just from life's everyday experiences. And imagine if every adult in America began looking at his or her personal life, professional life, and public life with the view toward making sure that whatever we do is good for children. There is no more fitting monument or tribute to those who died than to promise ourselves that we will do everything we can to prevent it from happening anywhere else. But more than just preventing something bad from happening, that we will commit ourselves to try to make a positive difference in the lives of those around us. We cannot roll back the clock and undo the tragic events of a month ago, but we can fight the bitterness and hopelessness that weaken our resolve to remain part of one community. We can reach out where children are taught to care and not to hate. We can offer a kind word to people. We can try to bridge the differences that too often come between us. And we can look for ways at all levels of society to make the changes we know we have to make. I hope that we'll be able to reach a better understanding of what we need to do to care for our young people. And I hope that if we all feel that we are Columbine, as the cheer goes, we won't give up until we do make it better for everyone. I want to introduce now someone I know who is resolved to do what he can, who has spoken out consistently on behalf of the needs of young people and families, who has tried to speak out against hatred and talk about how we need to reach out and help each other. And as I do, I want to just leave you with the words of a poet who means a lot to my husband and me, the Nobel Prize winner, Seamus Heaney. 
in one of our favorite poems, coming out of the terrible troubles that he's written about and experienced in Northern Ireland, where bombs and your fears, your aspirations. And imagine what could happen if more young people talked more openly with one another, as well as with their parents and other adults, looking for ways to heal the wounds that all of us carry just from life's everyday experiences. And imagine if every adult in America began looking at his or her personal life, professional life, and public life with the view toward making sure that whatever we do is good for children. There is no more fitting monument or tribute to those who died than to promise ourselves that we will do everything we can to prevent it from happening anywhere else. But more than just preventing something bad from happening, that we will commit ourselves to try to make a positive difference in the lives of those around us. We cannot roll back the clock and undo the tragic events of a month ago, but we can fight the bitterness and hopelessness that weaken our resolve to remain part of one community. We can reach out where children are taught to care and not to hate. We can offer a kind word to people. We can try to bridge the differences that too often come between us. And we can look for ways at all levels of society to make the changes we know we have to make. I hope that we'll be able to reach a better understanding of what we need to do to care for our young people. And I hope that if we all feel that we are Columbine, as the cheer goes, we won't give up until we do make it better for everyone. I want to introduce now someone I know who is resolved to do what he can, who has spoken out consistently on behalf of the needs of young people and families, who has tried to speak out against hatred and talk about how we need to reach out and help each other. And as I do, I want to just leave you with the words of a poet who means a lot to my husband and me, the Nobel Prize winner, Seamus Heaney. In one of our favorite poems, coming out of the terrible troubles that he's written about and experienced in Northern Ireland, where bombs and guns have been too much the experience of children. He writes, so hope for a greater sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe that a further shore is reachable from here. Believe in miracles and cures and healing wells. I believe in miracles and cures and healing wells. I believe that each of us has a responsibility to do what we can to reach that farther shore. And I introduce now someone who believes that with all of his heart, the President of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do that cheer for me one more time. We are Columbine! 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 Thank you. Dr. Hammond, Mr. DeAngelis, President DeStefano, and the 
state legislators, county commissioners, Attorney General Salazar, especially Governor Owens, thank you for being here. To all the uh, officials who are here, most especially to the students of Columbine and the students who are here from Chatfield and Dakota Ridge, and Heather Dinkle, thank you for standing up here in front of this big crowd and making a fine talk. Weren't you proud of her? She did a good job representing you today. <clears throat> I want to say a, a special word of thanks to the families <clears throat> who met with Hillary and me before we came over here for telling us the stories and showing us the booklets commemorating the lives of their very special children. I also want to thank the fine young people that, who still are hospitalized, with whom I spoke by telephone yesterday. Two of them, Patrick Ireland and Sean Graves, are here today. They left the hospital to be here. And I know there are some other people here who are also still injured who have come. I, I thank all of you for coming. This has been a long, hard month for all of you. And as Hillary said, it's been a hard month for America. You heard her say that part of our job in these last six years, more than we ever could have imagined when we moved to Washington after the election in 1992 has been to be with grieving people. After the Oklahoma City building was blown up and the embassies were blown up and our airmen were killed in the bombing in Saudi Arabia and so many other occasions. And last year, several times after violence in schools. But something profound has happened to your country because of this. I want you all to understand that. I'm not even sure I can explain it to you. One of the incidents of school killing last year occurred in my home state. It's a small state. I was governor there 12 years. I knew the people involved. It was heartbreaking. One of the mothers of one of the children who was killed still works with us for safer schools and safer childhoods. And all America agreed, but I think they thought, oh, this is terrible. I wish somebody would do something about this. But somehow when this happened here, maybe because of the scope of it, and I think mostly because of you, how you reacted, all of you, the, the, the relief workers, the law enforcement people, the, the family members who were brave enough to, to speak, there was a different reaction. People thought, this has happened in my neighborhood. What can I do? I say that because you have a unique chance, a chance, to make sure that the children of Columbine are never forgotten. But first you have to deal with you and your lives. You're all left with searing memories and scars and unanswered questions. There has to be healing. There have to be answers. And for those things that will not heal or cannot be answered, you have to learn to go on with your lives. I hope you have been comforted by the caring 
not only of your neighbors, but of your country and people from all around the world. All America has looked and listened with shared grief and enormous affection and admiration for you. We have been learning along with you a lot about ourselves and our responsibilities as parents and citizens. When America looks at Jefferson County, many of us see a community not very different from our own. We know if this can happen here, it can happen anywhere. And we see with admiration the fundamentally strong values and character of the people here, from the students to the school officials to the community leaders to the parents. I think most Americans have looked at you and thought, among other things, that God forbid if something like this should ever happen to us, I hope we would behave as well. I hope we would also hold on to our faith as well. I am impressed that you are moving forward. Most of the children have returned to school, even returned to sports and other activities. I am proud of all of you who are in your own way, going back to living your lives, looking toward the future, to commencement or college or a summer job or just getting back to the ordinary business of life, which takes an extraordinary effort now. But I have to say, I think what's impressed me most is the way in the midst of this you have held on to your faith. One of the greatest moments of grief in my life occurred 15 years ago when Hillary and I had to go to the memorial service for a young man who was a senior at Yale University, a Rhodes Scholar, on the football team, the editor of the newspaper, the leader of his class academically. This young man happened to come from an African-American family in the, our hometown and a poor family at that. His father was a minister in a very small church. And we had the service in the high school auditorium. His father was lame, and he walked with a pronounced limp. And he gave his son's eulogy, walking up and down in front of us with his limp, saying, his mother and I do not understand this. But we believe in a God too kind ever to be cruel, too wise ever to do wrong, so we know we will come to understand it by and by. In the scriptures, St. Paul says that all of us in this life see through a glass darkly, so we must walk by faith, not by sight. We cannot lean on our own wisdom. None of this can be fully, satisfactorily explained to any of you. But you cannot lose your faith. The only other thing I really want to say to you is that throughout all your grief and mourning and even in your cheers and your renewal and your determination to get on with your life and get this school back together and show people what you are, there is something else you can do and something I believe that you should do for yourselves and your friends to make sure they will be remembered, every special one of them. Your tragedy, though it is unique in its magnitude, is, as you so well know, not an isolated event. Hillary mentioned there was another school shooting in Atlanta today. Thankfully, the injuries to the students don't seem to be life-threatening. But there were several last year which did claim lives. We know somehow that what happened to you has pierced the soul of America. And it gives you a chance 
to be heard in a way no one else can be heard by the president and by ordinary people in every community in this country. You can help us to build a better future for all our children. A future where hatred and distrust no longer distort the mind or harden the heart. A future where what we have in common is far more important than what divides us. A future where parents and children are more fully involved in each other's lives. In which they share hopes and dreams, love and respect, a strong sense of right and wrong. A future where students respect each other even if they all belong to different groups or come from different faiths or races or backgrounds. A future where schools and houses of worship and communities are literally connected to all our children. A future where society guards our children better against violent influences and weapons that can break the dam of decency and humanity in the most vulnerable children. One thing I would like to share with you that I personally believe very much. These dark forces that take over people and make them murder are the extreme manifestation of fear and rage with which every human being has to do combat. The older you get, the more you'll know that a great deal of life is the struggle against every person's own smallness and fear and anger. And a continuing effort not to blame other people for our own shortcomings or our fears. We cannot do what we need to do in America unless every person is committed to doing something better and different in every walk of life, beginning with parents and students and going all the way to the White House. For the struggle to be human is something that must be a daily source of joy to you so you can get rid of your fears and let go of your rage and minimize the chance that something like this will happen again. Because of what you have endured, you can help us build that kind of future as virtually no one else can. You can reach across all the political and religious and racial and cultural lines that divide us. You have already touched our hearts. You have provoked Hillary and me and the Vice President and Mrs. Gore to reach out across America to launch a national grassroots campaign against violence directed against young people. You can be a part of that. You can give us a culture of values instead of a culture of violence. You can help us to keep guns out of the wrong hands. You can help us to make sure kids who are in trouble, and there will always be some, are identified early and reached and helped. You can help us do this. Two days from now, you're going to have your commencement. It will be bittersweet. It will certainly be different for those of you who are graduating than you thought it was going to be when you were freshmen. But as I understand it, there will be some compensations. Even your arch rivals at Chatfield will be cheering you on. When you hear those people cheer for you, I want you to hear the voice of America. Because America will be cheering you on. And remember that a commencement is not an end, it is a beginning. 
you got to help us here. Take care of yourselves and your families first. Take care of the school next. But remember, you can help America heal. And in so doing, you will speed the process of healing for yourselves. This is a very great country. It is embodied in this very great community, in this very great school, with these wonderful teachers and children and parents. But the problem which came to the awful conclusion you face here is a demon we have to do more to fight. And what I want to tell you is we can together. I close you with this story. My wife and I and our daughter have been blessed to know many magnificent people because the American people gave us a chance to serve in the White House. But I think the person who's had the biggest influence on me is the man who is about to retire as the president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela. He is 80 years old. He served 27 years in prison. For 14 years, he never had a bed to sleep on. He spent most of his years breaking rocks every day. And he told me once about his experience. And I asked him, how did you let go of your hatred? How did you learn to influence other people? How did you embrace all the differences and the, the literally the centuries of oppression and discord in your country and let a lot of it go away? How did you get over that in prison? Didn't you really hate them? And he said, I did hate them for quite a long while. After all, look what they took from me, 27 years of my life. I was abused physically and emotionally. They separated me from my wife, and it eventually destroyed my marriage. They took me away from my children, and I could not even see them grow up. And I was full of hatred and anger. And he said, one day I was breaking rocks and I realized they had taken so much and they could take everything from me except my mind and my heart. Those things I would have to give away. I decided not to give them away. I see here today that you have decided not to give your mind and your heart away. I ask you now to share it with all your fellow Americans. We love you and we need you. Thank you and God bless you.